Welcome. I would like to welcome you all to the first of a series of P2P virtual workshops for 2022. My name is Maciej Karpinski and I am an Assistant Director in Policy Research at Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada. Today, we'll be exploring issues in the broader sense around access to justice. Over the past several years, the Department of Justice has been working in close collaboration with departments across the federal family on various initiatives to gain greater insight into how the legal system works, its effectiveness, and specifically its accessibility. A few years ago, the Department of Justice approached Immigration, Refugee, and Citizenship Canada to see whether we would be interested in participating in the development of the Canadian Legal Problems Survey. Susan will, tell, uh, will shortly tell us more about this survey. IRCC recognized that, Im that the immigrant journey can be a highly justiciable one. Decisions about immigration status is probably one of the more familiar challenges IRCC encounters. But it is also recognized that the settlement journey includes other problems of integration, such as workplace discrimination, housing, divorce, and child custody. IRCC agreed to participate in the development of this survey to learn more. It was soon recognized that certain subpopulations may not be adequately captured by the survey, including immigrants. A decision was made to conduct a series of community-based studies targeting specific subpopulations. Under the leadership of the Department of Justice with generous funding from Women and Gender Equality Canada, as well as IRCC, we were able to fund two studies that specifically looked at the experience of immigrants and refugees in Western and Central Canada in dealing with major legal problems, the subject of today's workshop. Susan McDonald from the Department of Justice will first give us an overview and some preliminary results from the 2021 Canada Legal Problems Survey. Her presentation will be followed by Vicki Esses and Alina Sutter from the University of Western Ontario as well as Florentine Verhage from the Intercultural Association of Greater Victoria, who will dive into two studies that specifically examine some of the problems, challenges, outcomes and impacts of legal problems experienced by various immigrants. I believe you will find all our biographies online. Each presenter will be, uh, have between 10 and 20 minutes to present, after which we will proceed with the Q&A period. I do encourage you to submit your questions as they come up during the presentations. Et je vous encourage de le faire dans la langue officielle de votre choix. Tenant compte que cet atelier est en anglais, je vais traduire les, la question ou les questions, mais la réponse aux questions va être donnée en anglais. We will answer the questions only after the completion of all presentations. We will wrap up the workshop with some final remarks situating the results of these studies against a series of access to justice indicators. But before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. While, uh, while I come to you from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people, we meet today on a virtual platform. And I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands that we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. Please join me in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and to consider how we are and can each in our own way try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Thank you. I would now like to turn to Susan who will start us off. Susan. Great. Thank you, Maciej. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. And on this particular day, the 18th of January, because it's a day that at least I have been looking forward to uh, for quite some time. And this morning at 8.30, uh, Statistics Canada released the first report of a, sort of the first set of results for the Canadian Legal Problems Survey 2021. So what I'm going to do just in a few short minutes is uh, give you some background to this study, why it's important. Matt has already explained a little bit of the link between uh, that survey, study survey, 
and what you're going to hear about the qualitative studies that we're going to hear about today. So I won't uh, go into a lot of detail on that, and then we'll move right, um, hand it over the floor over to Vicki and Alina. Um, so as I said, just really, really pleased to be here. In uh, the Canadian Legal Problems Survey is an example of what is called in sort of the access to justice uh, discipline sector realm world is called a legal problems or a legal needs survey. And these have been done, they actually, the sort of researchers have determined that these surveys, probably the first one was done in the 1930s in the US, but they became much more popular in the 90s being done by the American Bar Association, as well as in the UK. Since that time, they've spread and they've been done by countries all over the world. So countries like the Netherlands and Scotland and Australia and Canada, um, but also countries like Argentina and Mexico and Colombia and Ghana and Kenya and uh, South Korea, you know, that there's this huge, huge um, application for countries, uh, regardless of where they are or what, whether they have a common law or a, a civil law system of justice. And in Canada, we started doing these surveys, um, kind of building on what had been learned in the UK and at the Department of Justice, uh, where I work with the research group. We um, did three cycles of those surveys in 2004, 2006, 2008. And uh, the principal researcher in charge of that plan of research, Ab Curry, um, is really, we call him the grandfather of legal needs surveys in Canada. Um, and he, he just smiles and says, well, he's not that old yet, but he, and he continues to do work on it. So that's the name that's associated with the history in Canada. In 2014, the survey was done by York University and the Canadian Forum on Civil Justice with a grant from Shirk. And they added some questions on costs. So up until 2014, the survey questionnaire itself didn't change very much. And, but they did add on these questions of costs, so financial costs. We came along in 2018 and uh, in talking with people in the field, in particular the National Action Committee on Access to Justice and Civil and Family Matters, which was a group that was started by former Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin. We actually approached Statistics Canada to see if they would do undertake to implement the, the survey, really. And they did. Um, it was through cost recovery, which meant they did if we paid for it. So we reached out to a number of federal departments to assist in this. Justice people may or may not know we are not a research department. Our research group is very, very small. And uh, Statistics Canada is, uh, they're really, really good. Best of the best in terms of their, the rigor in their methods and uh, data collection. So in 2018, we started and our, the fruits of mostly their labor um, are being released in the first report today. So on the website, there are a number of links for the daily announcement from StatsCan, which gives you a nice short summary of this particular Juristat. Juristat is the name of the report that comes out of the Canadian Centre for Justice and Community Safety Statistics that wrote, uh, that analyzed the data and uh, wrote the report. So this first Juristat was released this morning. There are also links to the HTML and the PDF version. And we've also provided a link to the Department of Justice's set up specific web pages that include, yes, the link to the Statistics Canada survey, but for the purposes of this presentation, more importantly, I think, 
are the links to um, not all yet, but the qualitative studies that we have done also undertaken or contracted to have undertaken. And why these studies, these qualitative ones that we're going to hear about today are so important is that a general population uh, self-reported uh, national, national only in the 10 provinces though, uh, survey provides really valuable quantitative data, provides national numbers, we can break them down by province and or region, and really, really important from a policy and a program perspective and decision making, having these numbers really important. But we also don't get the depth and the richness that can be provided through qualitative uh, work. We also knew that while we were able to oversample uh, the Indigenous population, and so we can actually report in some detail on First Nations and Métis people, we um, weren't going to be doing oversamples on some other smaller subpopulations, as Maché said. So, what we wanted to do was try to capture some of those experiences and set out to do, um, in the end, we put in place uh, 13 studies, working with either um, NGOs or with those in academia who had strong contacts with NGOs and specific communities. And in addition to the two on immigrants, we have three, uh, we did three studies with persons with disabilities, um, three studies with LG, well, two studies with LGB people sort of in the west and east of the country, one with trans people across the country, and uh, two with black Canadians, one in Ontario and one in Quebec. And all of these, as you'll hear from um, the other speakers on the panel, all of them asked the same type of questions as were asked on this survey. So in the survey itself, there are three parts, the identification of the legal of the problem, the serious problem. And people aren't asked if they experienced a legal problem, they're asked if they experienced a serious problem that was difficult to resolve. And then if they say yes, within the last three years, they then are asked to, um, they go through an identification process. The second part of the survey is all about resolving the problem if they tried to resolve it. Did they do the self-help? Did they talk to family or friends? Did they call a lawyer? Did they know where to look to call a lawyer? Um, so we're really, really interested in both the formal justice system, you know, calling a lawyer and having it resolved at a tribunal, for example, um, but also informal means and how often um, that, is, uh, that is the way that problems are getting resolved. And then the third and final uh, area of inquiry is around the impacts of the problem and trying to resolve it on people. And we've asked both about financial impacts, so the, the actual costs, but also things like stress, mental health, uh, physical health. And um, those findings are really, really important to see, you know, the toll that these kind of problems and the difficulty that people have resolving them takes. So um, with that, what I just one last thing I want to add is that the qualitative studies, most are done, some are still, um, the ones on Indigenous uh, people are still not completed yet. So they're being released sort of several each month. And the two that Vicki and Alina and Flor and Teen are going to be speaking to are on the Justice website and you can access them there in French or English. And uh, today, actually today, this morning, the three studies on persons with disabilities were released. The two on Black Canadians will be released in February. And then we have a couple more in March and uh, probably later in the spring. So keep checking back to the website and um, really, really, as I said, just really excited to be here today and uh, listen to these presentations. I think these were fabulous, fabulous studies. And I think that we can all really learn a lot 
from, um, from what we've been told and our thanks to all those who participated in the work as well. So I'll hand it over now to Vicki and Alina for the results of results and method on the first study. Great, thank you. So Alina and I will be talking about uh, looking at serious legal problems facing immigrants and potential immigrants in London and Toronto, Ontario. And uh, this is work that we couldn't have done without our two partners, the South London Neighborhood Resource Centre in London and Costi Immigrant Services in Toronto. So Susan has already talked about what we mean by serious legal problems, but I'll go through this just a, a bit quickly then. So serious legal problems are problems that arise out of people's normal activities, but they have a legal aspect and they could potentially be resolved through the legal system. For example, problems with debt, problems with employment, neighbors, family, discrimination, for example. And within a three year period, we know that almost half of adult Canadians will experience one or more legal problems that they consider to be serious and difficult to resolve. But there's really limited knowledge about the experiences of recent immigrants who may be especially likely to experience and not be able to resolve their legal problems. Next slide, please. So in order to fill this gap, um, we conducted a qualitative study uh, with the following research questions. And I should mention, these are the same research questions that were also asked in the study that Florentine is going to talk about. Um, so for example, what types of legal problems have recent immigrants experienced in the last three years? Um, very rich information about this. What factors seem to have contributed to these legal problems? How have recent immigrants tried to resolve their legal problems? Have they resolved their problems, for example, through recourse to the formal legal system? And if they haven't, why not? Uh, what has been the outcome of these efforts? Have they successfully resolved their problems? And then as Susan said, there are major economic, social and health impacts um, or potential impacts that we asked about. So we conducted 21 interviews with recent immigrants based in London and Toronto. And uh, the, these interviews were conducted in August to December, 2020. Um, as I mentioned in London, the participants were recruited through the South London Neighborhood Resource Center. And in Toronto, they were recruited through Costi Immigrant Services. We conducted semi-structured interviews using an interview guide. So large questions and then probes to get at more detail. And these interviews were conducted on Zoom. We provided an interpreter if required. They lasted somewhere between one and two hours, depending on how much people really wanted to talk about the issue. The interviews were audio recorded and the interview noted down key points. So in terms of our participants, you can see that uh, many were refugees or refugee claimants. Um, and you may be thinking, okay, refugee claimants aren't immigrants, but all these people were on their way to at least trying to become permanent residents. A few family class uh, immigrants, skilled worker, and then uh, two individuals, a temporary foreign worker and an international student who specifically asked to participate in this study. And we couldn't say no. Um, you can see that they came from a really large range of countries, um, six from Colombia, but then a, a whole range of other countries. In terms of age, you can see that the range was from 19 to 60 with the average at 39 years. Um, a bit more women than men, uh, one transgender and one un unidentified individual. Also their education level really um, covered the spectrum. So from less than a high school diploma all the way up to university graduate degree and uh, really diverse in terms of education level. So what types of serious legal problems did these people encounter. And I should note that they could actually talk about more than one type of legal problem, and some people actually did. Um, and you can see here that immigration problems were frequent, housing problems, family issues and relationship breakdowns, employment-related problems, and problems obtaining government assistance and services. So really what's nice about these data are that they're so rich. And so we really wanted to give you some examples of all these different types of problems. In terms of immigration problems, 
uh, there was a refugee claimant who had to wait over two years to have his refugee hearing. And he said that this process was much longer than everybody else he talked to, who he thought were in the same situation as him. Um, an individual who paid a paralegal to help her submit her refugee claim. And then the paralegal charged her, but didn't provide the service. And a refugee claimant who was told to leave the country after her initial application was rejected. Um, but this was during the pandemic and she couldn't leave the country and she was now waiting for permanent residence based on humanitarian and compassionate grounds. And the international student who came to Canada with her husband and two children, and because of COVID-19, she and her husband had lost their jobs. They couldn't pay tuition and they faced the risk of deportation if she lost her study permit. And she said, my husband and I were working, both of us. I was working remotely for a company in Spain and my husband and I own a company in Colombia. But after COVID, I lost my job in Spain and we had to close our company in Colombia because we're a sports company and we couldn't work now with COVID. So by the end of term, I was due to pay $15,000 and that's not possible now. So they were very worried about what they were gonna do. Housing problems were very frequent. Um, for example, landlords accusing tenants of causing property damage that they claimed they hadn't created. And then the landlord demands money, of course, for repairs. Um, a few people talked about arranging housing before they arrived in Canada, but when they got here, the accommodation wasn't what they were told it was gonna be. Um, an immigrant had rented a room based on a verbal agreement and didn't sign a contract. And then of course there were disagreements about that verbal agreement and it led, it led to a quite a bit of conflict. Um, several people talked about landlords threatening them and becoming verbally and physically abusive. So this one person um, stated that a few days after I arrived, he started complaining about things I would do. I started to think, why would he rent out his room if he got easily irritated by the people he would sublet to? When I was in the bathroom, the guy knocked on the door and cursed at me. He physically harassed me and he spat at me. I didn't know what to do, so I called my friend and asked for advice. My friend told me to call the police and they arrived, but then you'll see the consequence wasn't good. I had to move out that same night along with all my belongings, and then I had to search for another person who was able to sublet to me. Uh, family issues um, were another type of uh, problem that were frequently reported. Um, so an immigrant was sponsored by family members who harassed and verbally abused him and forced him to work for pay below minimum wage. Um, the sponsors also opened two credit cards in his name without his knowledge, leading him into debt. Um, women who were trying to get divorced were left with no money and were fighting for spousal and child support. Um, several women talked about facing domestic violence and abuse even after separation. So this person who had a child with them said, the situation is becoming more and more unbearable. We're not allowed to use water. If it was up to him, we wouldn't even shower. We are not allowed to use electricity. We've been in trouble about the heat. He said we could stay here for a year and that year is coming to an end. I don't know what we're gonna do in the future. The present situation is not the future I want for my child. Employment related problems were also frequently reported. So for example, a temporary foreign worker submitted a claim to Workplace Safety Insurance Board, which was approved, but the um, employer tried to appeal this decision twice. An immigrant talked about being fired for no apparent reason. And an immigrant talked about the manager ordering them around as if they were not human and violating their working rights. A particularly bad situation was an immigrant who was not paid for his work. And he tried to confront his employer about it many times. But he says, my employer was too smart. I saw him writing checks for other employees and I confronted him about it. My employer said, don't worry, he'd pay me later that I should trust him because we are from the same country. He told me he'd give me money every three or four months. At that time I believed him and I waited and he reassured me that he would pay. He was telling me that he was going to pay me because I'm an honest guy and that he'll pay me extra. It was four months that he always looked for an excuse. Then I talked to him seriously and he scared me. And for two months then I had problems with him every day. And a number of people reported having problems obtaining government assistance or services. For example, 
an immigrant who was approved for permanent residency on humanitarian and compassionate grounds couldn't obtain his health card, although he had received the confirmation letter for permanent residency. Another immigrant had difficulty uh, obtaining Ontario disability support. Um, and an immigrant woman changed her marital status and then had difficulty having her child tax benefit reinstated after this change. So you can see that these are very rich and um, quite concerning legal problems that these people were facing. And over to Alina. Thank you, Vicky. Um, so one of the things that we also asked um, immigrants during our interviews was what factors they thought contributed to their serious legal problems. And our analysis of the interviews found five commonly mentioned factors. The first one was unfamiliarity with Canadian law and their rights. For example, one of the interviewees who did not get paid for his work mentioned the following. It was very difficult to find information about employees' rights and work standards. I tried to find information on Google. A second factor that was uh, commonly mentioned was the unfamiliarity with basic Canadian customs and norms for everyday living. And this was often the case in the context of uh, renting uh, housing. So for example, uh, one person said, in terms of places to go, I would have looked for an interpreter before leasing. So they could help me understand exactly how the renting process works here in Canada. To this day, I still don't understand how it works. A third factor that immigrants identified as contributing to their serious legal problems was self-reported discrimination. An example is the quote from an interviewee who mentioned that he was discriminated against at work. He mentioned, the employers looked at us differently, like we, were, we are lesser and we have to follow everything they say and tell us to do. One day, a worker accidentally had gum fall out of his mouth. The employer said to him, if she ever saw a piece of gum fall out of anyone's mouth again, she would make them pick it up with their mouth next time. I should mention that when analyzing the um, themes in terms of the factors that contributed to the serious legal problems, we explicitly focused on self-reported discrimination, meaning instances where um, immigrants really mentioned discrimination as one of the factors leading or contributing to their problems. Two other factors that were um, commonly mentioned were a lack of or inefficient communication from the government or government agencies, as well as the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, causing delays in the processing of immigration applications or delays in obtaining information about their immigration status um, due to the pandemic. So how did immigrants in our sample attempt to resolve their problems? So first, it's important to note that when they were confronted with their serious legal problems, immigrants often did not know where to go to obtain help. They also reported having limited networks in Canada that could help them navigate the system to resolve their serious legal problems. For this reason, they tried to seek advice from family members in Canada and abroad, as well as friends. But then in the end, immigrants tended to actually receive help from individuals with whom they were already in contact in some other capacity. And these were individuals such as teachers, family doctors, settlement workers. And it's important that this um, help was often the result of like a chance interaction. So it was not so much the result of a targeted effort, but um, just a chance interaction that happened in their everyday life. And that's how they uh, ended up receiving help. A last point that we would like to mention is that um, immigrants who entered Canada as refugees or were sponsored by family members often could not resolve conflicts or issues on their own due to the language barrier. Um, next, we also uh, investigated um, how many of our um, interviewees, how, uh, immigrants, um, seek to involve the legal system to resolve their problems. And what we can see here is that a bit more than half, 57%, involve the legal system in one way or another. For example, five interviewees obtained legal advice. Um, Three of them, they obtained free legal advice from a legal aid or paralegal. Two of them are paid for legal advice from a lawyer. Then we also had five cases um, that were active legal cases where immigrants were represented by lawyers that were paid by legal aid. And one case that was awaiting court appearance and one case facing an immigration problem who uh, decided to pay for the services of an immigration consultant and immigration lawyer. As I mentioned before, immigrants did not have a broad network that could help them easily find legal advice and legal representation. 
So they asked friends and other people that they happened to be in contact with in some other capacity for a referral. So in the end, immigrants who paid for legal advice from lawyers found their lawyers through friends. And immigrants who obtained legal aid were often referred to their lawyers by their settlement workers. Um, in most cases, immigrants found the legal advice and legal representation they had received um, helpful. Now, there were also um, uh, a bit less than half, uh, like a portion of immigrants who decided not to involve the legal system. An important question here was to find out, well, why was that the case? And three reasons were frequently mentioned. The first one was fear of consequences. Some immigrants were afraid to take legal action against others out of the fear that it might reflect badly on them or otherwise could um, affect their immigration application or their immigration status. For example, one person mentioned, when tied to a certain business, they're scared to talk and share their experience for fear of getting, back, getting sent back home as they don't have other options for work. Another commonly mentioned factor were the costs associated with obtaining legal advice. And these were financial costs, but also costs in terms of time. Um, one example of a person who was concerned about financial costs mentioned the following. We went to a lawyer. We went to a first advice consultation for them to explain us where to go and how to do it. But financially, we cannot afford it because it's almost 5,000 for the whole process. And a third reason that was commonly um, mentioned was just a desire to focus on the future and leave um, problems uh, in the past and just to move on. So what were the outcomes of immigrant serious legal problems in our study? Uh, for five of our uh, 21 immigrants, um, the case was no longer a problem. So for two of them, actually, the problem was successfully resolved. And the other three, they just simply learned to move on and leave the problem in the past. So they were no longer dealing with it. Um, then there were another five cases where one problem was resolved, but they were still dealing with a, a second problem that they were facing. And then for 11 uh, immigrants, they were still dealing with their problem or they had made a bit of progress, but it was not yet resolved. So what the, were the consequences of um, having to deal with these um, serious legal problems? In terms of economic impact, immigrants in our study had additional expenses because of the problems. So as a result, they often had to borrow money from friends and neighbors. Another common consequence was that uh, they had to apply for social assistance, such as Ontario Works or employment insurance benefits. And another economic impact that emerged was that immigrants' housing situations were affected at times. Uh, this was the case for immigrants with housing problems and immigrants with relationship breakdowns who had to find out other places to live. And this was often, um, or this often led to having to accept poor living conditions or expensive rentals just because there was not enough time to look for another place to live. As an example, a woman who separated from her husband mentioned the following. He left us with, without any money, without anything. The money we got from Ontario Works was not enough to pay the rent, so we couldn't pay. One day we were shocked with the decision from the owner that we have to leave at this date. That was a final decision for him. I tried, I looked everywhere for a place to move in until I found an apartment, two bedrooms only. Though it was small for us, that was the only option in front of me. So we moved to that small apartment. Immigrants with different types of problems also suffered social consequences. This included tensions with family members, ruined friendships, reduced collegiality within work settings. And as an example, a woman who got a divorce and found that it impacted her socially reported the following. The situation with my ex-husband ruined my social life. I had a close friend. We were meeting almost every day, all our trips with each other, all our phone calls. I don't have them anymore. We had this warmth, we liked each other, but her husband supported my husband with the divorce and with everything. Finally, there were also um, serious health consequences. This included physical and mental health consequences. Um, this included cases of sleep, de like, uh, sleep loss, sleep deprivation, headaches, blood pressure problems, stress, anxiety, depression, and loneliness. One man after losing his job reported, it has affected me. I wish I could go back to my country, but it is impossible with the war there. I don't even like to eat. Sometimes I will sleep without eating anything. 
Emotionally and psychologically, I'm not feeling well. I just want to go back to work. I don't want to stay home. So our findings show the importance of ensuring that newcomers have access to support to solve their serious legal problems, and especially point to the following recommendations. First, to invest more in information provision to newcomers, including providing more information about Canadian law and immigrants' rights, as well as Canadian customs and norms in central domains, such as housing and employment. Also, to deliver information in a variety of languages as part of the settlement process. And another important point uh, is to provide information about available legal resources before immigrants are confronted with a serious legal problem. So once they are dealing with the problem, they know what to do and where they can go for help. Finally, um, given that non, uh, workers at not-for-profit and community-based organizations were often um, the place where immigrants in our sample found help, that would suggest that it would be important to continue to support and provide um, these individuals with detailed and updated information on sources of legal information and assistance that they can then pass on to um, their clients. And the last uh, point that I would like to make um, or recommendation that I would like to make is to explore different options to continue to provide affordable professional legal services for immigrants. And for more information, uh, you can find our contact information here as well as the link to our um, report. So thank you for your attention. And I believe Florentine, you're gonna talk about your study next. Thank you. It's um, it's a pleasure to be here and to be part of this important uh, discussion. I'm Florentine Verhaag and I work at the Intercultural Association. And I, I actually want to open with also saying that it was a real honor to do this work, um, um, to, to be able to speak to, in my case, these 20 uh, individuals. Um, who who opened up and who, who told me about the issues that they've been facing. And that's something that we can't take for granted because these very often really personal um, um, and deeply um, difficult issues to talk about. Um, one thing that I noticed in, in, in speaking about this that, is that I sometimes even just had to ask one question and it came all um, um, out, right? People wouldn't want to stop talking. And part of that was, because very often they felt they had not yet been heard, right? Even several one went, went through court cases and talked with other people about it, but they never had this opportunity to just talk through it from beginning to end. And they really felt that um, um, they had not been heard. And so one person, for example, shared with me, um, I think to me, it's healing that I get to speak the truth, like the truth exactly how I felt, how I saw it as a violence. So it's really healing. Um, so I just wanted to open with that um, acknowledgement and thanking all the participants. I will leave the land, the lovely land acknowledgement that Mathieu shared. Um, stand. I just want to add that for in, in my case, um, I want to particularly recognize the Esquimalt and the Songhees uh, on whose uh, territory ICA is situated. So the study that I did um, went through uh, ICA, which is. Um, um, and, uh, which offers services for immigrants and refugees, including settlement and integration services, translation and interpretation. ICA is the, the largest um, settlement organization um, on um, Vancouver Island. Um, and ICA has been doing that work for years. Um, we've just celebrated our 50th uh, anniversary. And why I think that's important to note is that um, what I did notice was that whenever we reached out to people in Victoria and area, uh, people were willing to share quite personal and quite difficult stories, which was a little bit less so with the people that I talked to in Vancouver. Um, and while there is not much that we, since it's a small study that you, that we can um, um, fully conclude from that, um, I did, it, it does give that sense, right? When there is this long standing relationship of trust that you establish with a particular um, uh, community that that community also is willing to, to share. It was much easier to find people to participate in this study here in ICA, here in Victoria, because ICA already is quite established than in um, Vancouver. It was harder to reach out there because people were not necessarily aware of who we were, right? So it was just a strange organization <laughs> approaching them. Um, and so I thought that was an interesting um, 
something to mention there too. So I spoke um, to 20 individuals, 10 from Vancouver and 10 from Victoria, quite different uh, places. In one case, you have a large met metropolitan city, 41% um, of which are immigrants and about 50% of residents who are racialized. Uh, and Greater Victoria is much smaller, obviously has a small urban core with also a rural margin, 18% immigrants and 14% racialized individuals. Please note all these are statistics 2016 number, uh, census 2016 numbers. Um, obviously we're waiting for the, the new census numbers coming out this spring. Um, I will not say much about the setup of the study because I think um, both um, Vicky and Susan have done so uh, excellently. Uh, we use the same uh, procedures. Um, in terms of um, the, the profile of the participants, we I spoke to 10 women and 10 men. The majority of, of them were somewhere between 30 and 50 years old. Um, a lot of them were either full term or part full time or part time employed. Uh, and in my case, what was interesting is that the vast majority of them had a bachelor's degrees and in some cases also graduate. Uh, degrees. There was only one case there was someone of, of less than high school um, um, education. There were also some differences from the, the other study with respect to people's racial um, identification and immigration category. So um, many of the individuals that I spoke to were either South Asian or East Asian or Southeast Asian. Um, and immigration category, we had a lot of economic immigrants and uh, people who came here through family sponsorship. There were only two individuals who um, had refugee background and two temporary residents. Um, again, one major difference between these two studies was that um, I spoke to nine newcomers who had been here less than five years, but I also did speak to 11 established immigrants who had been here for more than six years. In some cases, I spoke to um, uh, an individual who had been here for 30 years. So um, um, that will, might also explain some of the differences that we have found. In terms of the types of serious legal problems, um, the largest group was discrimination. So 24%, 10 individuals um, had experienced, uh, in 10 cases, I shouldn't say individuals, 10 cases were cases of discrimination. One thing I want to point out, as, as Vicky also did, is we spoke to 20 individuals, but in terms of these, um, um, between the 20 of them, they shared 41 legal problems. Um, nine of them experienced only one legal problem, but um, 11 said that they experienced multiple legal problems. In one case, there was an individual who shared with us six um, legal problems. Um, some of those were directly connected. Um, so you can think about someone going through a divorce, but also um, going through child custody issues. Some were maybe more indirectly connected, but still connected because they all found their ground in one particular thing. So getting an injury at work that sort of cascades in multiple legal problems, even though the legal problems themselves are not directly connected. Um, and then there were also some people who experienced multiple problems that had no relation um, at all, right? So they could have an issue with an employer. And then a couple of years later, they had an issue with, um, with, with housing or something like that. Um, discrimination, as I said, was by far um, most often mentioned, um, and in 60% of the discrimination cases, it was about employment or housing. Uh, someone shared with us, I feel that often I'm only selected to increase the diversity ratio of the applicant pool, but I'm never seriously considered for the job. The difficulty with discrimination is that it's very hard to prove and that landlords and employers often give other reasons for not giving them the job or the house or the promotion. Um, so in many cases, as I also will later show, it, the people chose not, people experiencing discrimination chose not to challenge uh, it in court or, or go through any kind of um, official legal procedure to, to counter the decisions. One thing that I've added here is bias, right? Um, so in that, that's, I, I added here not as 
these, these are cases that are, do not really rise to the level of, of discrimination that you can legally challenge in court, for example. But it's what, these, what the people often describe as it's just latent bigger, bigotry that's everywhere and that affects the whole process. So it, it affects their legal case. It affects the way that um, um, they feel that people are responding to them, are taking up and helping them. Um, um, and it can also be a, a, a kind of like a subtle form of belittling. So one person shared with me that sometimes as immigrants, we're not very outspoken because of our language skills, but that does not mean that we don't know anything. So there was a sense that their language skills um, um, would, would also um, um, really affect the way that people were ready to believe their case, that people were ready to, to listen to them. I have a slightly longer quote that also speaks about that. Um, one of my participants said, being a woman, being a person of a different culture, being a person who speaks a different language, being a person who does not speak fluent English, I never thought that they were that important. But now having gone through these legal proceedings, I've witnessed what it means to be that person. I felt nobody really believed me. I felt voiceless. I felt not heard and not seen or not valued because I'm just a woman from a foreign country. The second largest group of um, issues that people face were family related problems, uh, often child custody um, and, and divorce um, or separation problems. Um, they were often complicated by other legal issues such as losing access to a house and losing jobs. Most of these were the cases of profound loss as someone who said, I'm losing all to keep my child safe. And in this case, this, this um, mother experienced food insecurity, housing insecurity and trauma after escaping her situation. So we're really seeing cases with multiple layers of vulnerability um, um, and all of them except one went through court and are waiting for a court date in the future. And most of them had legal aid. Some of the other uh, types of serious legal problems were housing problems, very much along the same line as Vicky and Aline have also shared similar type of stories. Employment related problems that had, were related to injuries or pay related problems, not receiving pay, um, pay being held back. Services and government assistance being denied a service or a service not being properly delivered. Um, just for grouping, I have also included some services that are not necessarily government um, related so there are also services like um, uh, moving companies, right, not delivering uh, services or breaking things. Immigration related um, problems were less, less often mentioned in the group of people I spoke to. Um, and um, there was one case of a related um, problem. I have to say with immigration related problems, there was also, I mentioned there, online fraud. So there was an online um, immigration official that this person thought they were approaching who asked for multiple increments of pay um, and then never delivered the service and did not turn out to actually be the expert that they were saying that they were. The strategies for resolving legal problems. 28% um, of the cases, people said they did not respond and they did not do or undertake any action. Very often that was with, because of discrimination. Um, um, so very often these were discrimination cases, right? Only two of the 10 discrimination cases were actually pursued. 43% um, of the cases did take legal recourse and in 78 of those, uh, the issue was indeed resolved. The other responses, um, people went to find advice online. Um, they also went and approached um, um, other services. So in some cases, they approached a settlement worker who then would, for example, say that, explain to them that there would, there's a transition house um, and then would go to transition houses. And so with the settlement worker and with the services, the transition house, they were then um, um, helped to understand the legal um, trajectory that they could take. Um, many, many still um, um, just, just approached personal networks instead, so did not approach um, their settlement workers, did not approach, uh, did not know what to do with the information online, um, and so they just asked their friends. Um, in one particular interesting case, there was direct negotiation um, as a group with the, with, with the other party the the other party so in this case um we're we're having an individual who who was dealing with a landlord who has made 
verbal promises to them as they arrived, and then was coming back on them and reneged on them, which made them at risk for having to lose their housing. And, and so first they said, because of the pandemic, you do not need to pay the full, um, the full rent. And then suddenly said, you do have to pay the full rent. And so now these people didn't have any place to go. Um, but they discovered that other people, other tenants had exactly the same problem. And so as they were saying, all of us in the building got together and we gave the landlord a call and all of us spoke together on a conference call and he agreed to everything. Um, so, so there was a really interesting example of, of um, standing stronger together. I see that I have two minutes left, so I'll make sure that um, I get everything in. So the barriers to justice in many cases was a lack of information uh, combined with issues, difficulties um, um, with language and jargon on the website. Many of the people I talked to actually did have um, quite a good control over English and they didn't necessarily see the English as being the problem as sometimes the jargon, the way that it was written, right? The complication of the English on, on the official website. They by far found an in-person email or in-person contact most valuable and helpful. Time pressures affected the ability. People said, I just need a job. I have no time to challenge this. Cost was not necessarily mentioned by participants as a barrier, but then they also did say that none of them were able to hire their own lawyers and then get legal aid. So in some sense, it was an issue. People, people were very grateful for legal aid, but perceived it often as slow, less experienced, with limited eligibility and hours available, and also felt that other parties with lawyers were able to eat up the hours and play the game so that they did not get as much out of the legal aid as they wanted to. Perceived chance of success where many people, right, um, decided not to act um, because it was not worth it or they just needed to get on with their lives and fear of consequences. People did not want to make um, um, being seen as troublemakers and they were worried that they might be risking their ability to stay in Canada. Um, consequences. Um, while every participant described some level of being stressed, 40% um, experienced serious health effects as a result of legal issues. Um, in one case, um, it involved someone saying, like, I have no money, I cannot go back, I feel trapped, I cannot get out, all I wanted was to die. Um, and was and so she was, was um, um, admitted into hospital um, with severe depression. Economic consequences, the loss of wages, a loss of houses or lost savings were mentioned. Um, and social consequences by, were by far seen as the most serious. 75% um, um, felt that, that it affected their relationship with friends and families and they felt a profound uh, sense of being alone. Um, six trends, um, I'll go through this quickly because men, much of it I've already mentioned. Discrimination is an underlying problem, but few choose to challenge it. It affects both the development of the problem and the way the problem can be arbitrated. The more complicated the legal issues, the more serious the consequences and specific immigrant of women of color were at risk for this. Um, people who arrived as refugees and immigrants who entered Canada under family category experienced more serious problems. Uh, and people really wish that there was better support for the legal assistance, for legal aid. They, they are very grateful that it's there, but they wish that it was better supported. Education levels, were not a good predictor in my case and in, 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 in the interviews I had to, to seeing people being able to navigate legal issues because most of the people I talked to had actually quite a high education, but they really want better availability of experts and legal navigators, more accessibility of information and better awareness and access to community resources. Um, I have two concluding thoughts here, um, which I will go quickly through many participants. Um, turn to their personal networks to get information, but also realize that that information was always not always reliable or true. Um, so that's the challenge of, of turning to your community. The benefit of turning to your community was that people felt lifted up um, and, and were able to help each other. Um, people felt a profound sense of powerlessness and shame, self-doubt, inertia, and hopelessness. All these feelings also sometimes stopped people from taking action because they were too ashamed. It made them feel less of themselves. But at the same time that they feel that their action showed 
a real determination and a strong sense of strength um, because while they were going through these really difficult um, um, experiences, moving mountains, as someone said, um, they really um, um, went on, found jobs, found housing, and kept their family safe. And so that led one of the participants to say, don't give up just yet, stay strong. It takes a lot of effort and courage to move here. For the sake of that courage, do not give up. And I'll end it here. Thank you. All right, thank you, Florentine. Thank you, Vicky and Alina and Susan. Um, Great presentations, uh, lots of rich information. And I see that we have a couple of questions that have, uh, that have come up through uh, the Q&A. So I think we'll address them. The first question, um, I'll put it to all perhaps, um, and uh, yeah, I'll put it to everyone. It's around legal information. So I guess I'm gonna interpret this question perhaps slightly differently in one uh, or break it up in one through your research did you did your did the participants identify a lack of information or was it really a question of um the inf information being there but not readily accessible um or yet was the information there but certain individuals uh, who were being um, sought out for help weren't in a position to provide that information. In other words, there were regulations or barriers that prevent, prevented them from doing so. Um, so two, three kind of questions in there. Um, maybe we could start unpacking that a bit. So first, maybe on the lack of information, did you find that uh, there was a general lack of information, legal information to assist uh, these individuals with their problems? Um, Vicky, okay, I'll jump in. Let's start off. With um, so I would yeah. say there is a lack of information, and people said a lot that they didn't know where to go to get the information. So it's even a step back where they don't have information about where to access legal information, if you know what I mean. So where do I go? Do I go to the settlement agency? Do I go online? Do I Google it? Like, what do I do? And so I would say the solution to that is telling people where the information is and then having a really central good place where this information is available. Um, yeah, I, I, I saw something quite similar. Um, um, people, right, if you do not know, so some, some women telling me I did not know there were transition houses, right? And so if, there's, if you do not know what kind of systems are in place to give you some protection, you don't even know that you can start looking. Um, um, and then obviously the, the lack of information, also, but also this, this sense of who can I trust with this story, right? So that, and, and, and are they gonna be able to help me? Um, um, what, what I also noticed, and I, Vicky, you said something similar in your study is that sometimes the solutions are just sort of breakthrough um, came by completely like accidentally, right? Talking to the mother of a friend who happened to be in HR who said, that's not okay. That's not how it's supposed to work. Um, um, so those types of situations or friends who said you can be protected, right? There is a place like this. So, so yeah, there was a, a true lack of information, but to then, then jump to the, to the next step, like the information to the sort of the acts. So even if the information is there, sometimes it's not accessible to people, right? Um, and I saw um, uh, great examples in, in um, people perceiving information to be accessible and not is that um, there, were, there were two cases where um, an individual went to the BC Ombudsman or, or there were a couple cases where people um, were challenging their um, landlord on withholding a damage deposit, right? Those processes were seen as easily accessible and clear. Those websites, there were very clear sort of boxes. You click here, you have a claim, you do this, you need this type of, of, of evidence. And so most of these cases, people said, yeah, it was some work to get through it, but we did it. And right, I, we were successful at it. Um, um, any kind of larger, more complex problem would land people on, on websites with, with a lot of sort of legalese jargon and not really sure how to go through it. So, so um, once the lack of information, once not knowing where to go was, was, was broached, right? Um, not always the information that they found online was helpful to individuals. 
Maybe I'll jump in and just add that in Canada, in each jurisdiction, we we have, um, at least the department has what we call designated public legal education and information organizations, and the Department of Justice Canada supports those. Um, and in, I can speak, I know Ontario uh, the best actually, but what you have with those organizations is that they will take on whether it's topics or addressing information to particular uh, subpopulations. It might be immigrants in some cases, or it might be um, I'm just thinking of like a topic, for example, like sexual assault or intimate partner violence. And they do the best they can, sort of with limited resources and decisions. A lot of the organizations have gone online, whereas we also know that for some people that's really difficult to access resources that are only online, especially if you think the pandemic, we, at least in Ontario, we couldn't get into our libraries <laughs> um, for most of it, can't right now either. But it um, one of the things that has struck me is how uh, these organizations have um, really tried to adapt to what they're seen as the needs out there. And so Community Legal Education Ontario, for example, that they are now doing training sessions with community-based organizations so yes. that, you know, whoever's on intake or the different settlement services or whoever is working with people who come in the front door um, are able to recognize, oh, that that has a legal dimension to it and you need to go. And Ontario has this sort of network of legal clinics where at least you can get kind of that referral or some of that basic information. BC also has um, actually a great, all sorts of different places to go, um, but you have to know about them. So I'm very, very sympathetic that, that if you don't know, and uh, if you aren't linked into settlement services, perhaps because you came in the business class, and so you haven't availed yourself of that, really difficult to know. And the internet is kind of like the Wild West in some ways. You don't know exactly what information to trust. There are different forums where people are sharing what they know, especially in the family law context. And a lot yeah. of that information is just inaccurate. So there's some real, some real, real challenges there. And um, again, just thinking of a recent initiative is that um, the federal department here set up information. So provide some funding for doing some programming around uh, harassment, sexual harassment in the workplace, where people mm -hmm. could go and get both information and some advice. Um, if they felt they had been sexually harassed in the workplace. And that's actually a really, really important area because there are so many different places you could go. You could go to a human rights complaints mechanism, or you could go to your union if you're unionized, or employment standards, or sort of there are all these different options and nobody really, really knows, and it, nobody wants to talk about it. So I just threw out some of those different ideas. And I also just wanted to mention that um, we have a report coming out. Um, I don't, can't give you the exact date, I'm sorry, but where we've done a catalog of these sort of on the ground, what we call legal clinics on the ground um, services for people to come and get that basic information. Um, I think BC is leading the pack <laughs> with the number of, and they tend to be in these civil areas. So less about criminal and more about the housing and employment and even family. And um, it's actually, I think it'll be a really useful tool for settlement services, but all community organizations. Um, because it, it provides a fairly comprehensive picture of what is out there. And so how do we get that information out there further so that we can we can share it as much as possible? Yeah, yeah thank you for that, Susan. I 
just want to add one thing that's, that's, that I thought about when you were talking is like in some cases, the experience that people have online will also affect the way that they're trusting and seeing sort of the official services. So in one particular case, I asked an individual like, did you ever approach like an immigration organization or a settlement worker or just share, right, to get to get some some idea of where to go? And they say, oh, no, no, because they had only um, um, encountered immigration consultants online. And as I said, in some cases, these are also fraudulent um, um, people. Um, and so they said, I don't trust these people. Right? They, they, I'm not sure if, if I can believe them. They are just out there getting my money. And so I don't approach anybody because, right? They're, they're thinking that everybody is, is that, that individually you, you can trust. And so that makes it really difficult because there are, there are as you're saying, um, programs out there that, that are really starting to provide that information and that education. But if someone already comes in it with that experience of mistrust, that is really hard. Um, and complicates the situation. So if I can jump in, I, I do think there are people who would use these resources, at least some people who would use these resources. And it would be fantastic if this catalog was available to every settlement agency across Canada, right? Yeah. Um, yes. The other thing I was thinking about is language classes, right? I know that a lot of settlement agencies provide useful information during language classes. And having organizations like Clio, you were talking about the Ontario Education Group, um, having them come into the language classes and just do a little presentation about if you need help, here's where to go, would be yeah. Super we used beneficial. to do that as law students actually, and uh, you know, couldn't give you cannot give out advice, but no. you can certainly say you know here are or hand out those pamphlets that people take home and they pin on their fridge and for when they need right. it, to right? kind of get to this advice because this uh, it, it falls within that domain of seeking out information, I think. And uh, if we look at the studies, we see that people are turning to um, chance encounters as they call, uh, as I think Florentine, you use the term. So doctors, teachers, um, social workers, is there a role for them to provide advice and I think Susan might weigh on on this because there is a distinction made in, in many jurisdictions across Canada who can and cannot provide legal advice. Yeah the, the, it's a great question Maché and all I would say is that uh, lawyers and it's right it's tightly tightly regulated um, lawyers who are members of their profession like their bar called to the bar in their jurisdiction are the only people who are allowed to provide legal advice with some small exceptions. So some paralegals in Ontario um, are now regulated through the Law Society of Ontario, but you can provide information. So what do we mean by information? Nothing that is fact specific. So you could say, hey, this community legal clinic is in our neighborhood here's the phone number, or here's the name in the phone number, call and find out what hours they're open, or are they open during COVID, or are they doing phone calls, so, you know, that kind of thing. Or Florentine, I think you gave the example, and we've certainly seen this, is, you know, not knowing there are transition homes. So to be able to say, it's wrong, it's a crime in Canada for your husband to hit you. You know, in some countries, it's not wrong. And so that kind of information is, you know, really important. And I don't mean it's not wrong. It's not considered a, a, a crime, I guess, Vicky. I saw your reaction. So let, let me sort of rephrase that. Um, the, so I think that sort of that basic information, you know, it's a crime in Canada to do this or... Um, you know, they cannot uh, hold on to your deposit if you have damaged, you know, you haven't damaged anything. Sort of some of these basic statements can go a long way. What you couldn't do is say, well, in your situation, because of X, Y, Z, this is what I would suggest you do. 
um, that is the purview only of those who are called to a bar in a province or territory. And it's a big issue because there's a gray area in there. Um, but there is some work, and I'll just mention, I know we're almost to the end of time, but Julie Matthews, who is the executive director at CLEO, Community Legal Education in Ontario, along with David Wiseman at the University of Ottawa Faculty of Law, um, the two of them have been working on sort of a policy framework that was funded by the Law Foundation of Ontario to look at what they're calling community justice help. And so the importance of, from an access to justice lens, the importance of really enabling, you know, and that could involve training and standards, but, and they look specifically at settlement services in terms of being able, empowered and enabled to provide um, good information and some of those basics because people aren't, and it would be through nonprofits that you wouldn't be making, you know, there would be people who are on salaries. Um, you're not charging people for that advice or information or anything like that. And it's really stimulated quite a discussion in different Whoops. Oh, I think we lost Susan. Yes. Well, we'll take advantage. We do have only a few minutes left. So I think, um, and there's some questions out there, most of which I think have been to some extent uh, answered in some capacity. Um, there are some specific comments that I think I would like our presenters to just have a look at afterwards that might uh, be of particular interest to the work that you're doing. Um, and then if uh, there are any, uh, anyone out there uh, who wishes to reach out to the researchers uh, directly, uh, your, their, uh, the, uh, the, the, our contact information is out there, please uh, feel free to fire off a, uh, an, uh, an email. Um, so I just wanted to uh, end with some concluding remarks. Um, and I just uh, thank you to all presenters, very fascinating. Um, I just wanted to recap a bit about some of the problems to try and bring these two uh, studies together in a kind of a uh, larger context also of uh, access to justice. So um, we, we heard about separation and divorce and child custody. We heard about housing disputes, disputes with landlords, threats to eviction, invasion of privacy, um, physical and verbal abuse. We heard about the uh, challenges with the immigration process, um, uh, case management, uh, immigration consultant frauds, um, uh, the, the risk to immigration status due to relationship uh, breakdowns with sponsors. Uh, we heard about the problems in employment, um, poor working conditions, uh, non-payment, especially in first survival jobs in Canada, wrongful dismissal. Uh, or termination without cause, inadequate compensation for workplace injuries. We heard about domestic violence, uh, specifically between conjugal partners, as well as uh, toward uh, other sponsored relatives, and even in some cases, the conduct of police. We heard a lot about discrimination into uh, access to jobs and promotional opportunities, uh, harassment, um, as well as uh, denial of goods and services. Uh, some of the key findings I think that we could draw from, uh, from both studies is that um, irrespective of the problem, uh, immigrants felt powerless throughout the process. And, but nevertheless, they did demonstrate a strong sense of determination and resilience to improve their situation and developed uh, strategies that employed both formal and informal dispute resolution processes, as well as information from multiple sources to help navigate uh, their particular problems. Um, I think uh, individuals whose legal status is insecure or was insecure uh, in, in Canada were particularly, were particularly at risk of experiencing legal problems, uh, fear of repercussion for taking legal action and limited services, think had a, a direct impact on their ability to address their problem. Um, 
refugees uh, and sponsor uh, and those sponsored by family uh, members also seem to have experienced quite severe legal issues uh, compared to other economic uh, compared to other immigrant classes, um, especially in terms of multiple problems, uh, uh, multiple ongoing problems or concomitant problems. Um, and it's in some ways not surprising given that this group of, of uh, individuals or uh, immigrants and refugees had uh, you know, the, their lack of language skills and uh, lack of personal networks uh, it could have had a limiting impact or a li limiting effect on their ability to, to move some of those problems forward. Um, immigrant women, especially racialized women, seem to have experienced um, multiple legal problems such as violence, followed by divorce and child custody. Um, what we found in terms, uh, when we looked at both studies, women and, when e women and men equally experienced legal problems, but there was a gendered effect in that men predominantly reported more problems related to employment, while women tended to report more family-related disputes or problems within the family law. Um, there are a few other a few other key uh, conclusions, and I'm uh, the presentation or these concluding remarks are available in your package, so I do uh, suggest you go through them if you're interested. What I wanted to do just quickly take is um, look at uh, tell us, uh, to see what these studies tell us overall about access to justice and to help us answer this question, I wanted to turn uh, to um, a tool that was developed by the Department of Justice called the Access to Justice Index. It was uh, developed in collaboration with other agencies as a self-assessment tool for administrative tribunals and bodies. But what is interesting about this index is that it offers a series of dimensions and indicators against which we can measure access to justice in the broadest sense. And it's comprised of these four dimensions or categories. This uh, first access to the process, to a mechanism, uh, be it formal and informal. The process itself, um, costs associated, both real and tangible, uh, or sorry, real and intangible, and resolutions or outcomes. So what we noticed was that participants often utilize both types of mechanisms, both formal and informal, to address their problems. About half of the participant used the courts to address family conflict, child custody, employment and discrimination and housing issues. But some found success in using informal mechanisms such as unfacilitated negotiation. Those who did not choose to use any mechanism um, to address their problems uh, were notable, uh, occurred where there were barriers, including fear of consequences, financial and non-financial costs, as well as specifically the evidentiary burden, uh, which was perceived as being too high. Uh, and the latter was particularly the case for situations of discrimination, which was uh, seen as difficult to establish. In terms of the process, uh, representation, about half the cases involved legal representation in the form of legal aid or pro bono services or hired counsel. In, uh, we've identified seven cases in which immigrants were self-represented. Having le legal representation was however seen as important for the satisfactory resolution of problems specifically related to family conflict, um, but self-representation uh, self also seemed to prove successful in the context of housing, for example. Another uh, indicator for processes information. We spoke a, a lot about this in the Q&A and that it was the most common complaint uh, that we found. The issue ranged from a general lack of familiarity with Canadian law, accessible online language, information in languages other than English and French, reliance or non, uh, on non-legal sources for information such as these chance encounters uh, with teachers, doctors, settlement workers. Um, but that to say, participants were not passive in their search for information. Most often participants relied on personal networks, friends and family, as well as information from settlement services, union transition houses. So people were actively engaged to find information, even though they struggled immensely in some cases in finding it. The, one of the concerns that was flagged, however, was the accuracy of the information when they were provide, when they found it. So it was never, never really entirely sure whether the information they relied on was actually um, accurate. Costs. Um, very few immigrants were able to pay for a legal counsel. The vast majority of cases that were we, we assessed through both studies um, had legal representation, uh, where, where there was legal representation relied on legal aid. 
eligibility requirements and limited funding per client to allow for legal representation through to the end of the process were commonly cited concerns. But there were also intangible costs, especially the incurred by a variety, uh, in, including the time required to pursue a legal problem while struggling to establish themselves as in a new country. The fear of consequences of legal action, for example, losing their job or harming their immigration process and the perceived chance of a resolution in their favor. In terms of outcomes and impact, while many legal problems were in, uh, judicially uh, arbitrated to some extent or addressed through informal mechanisms, the effects of facing these legal problems left long-term health, economic, and social consequences among all the participants. So what are some of the next steps? Well, as a department responsible for the admissibility and settlement of immigrants and refugees, there's perhaps work that can be done at the community level by helping and enabling um, these kind of chance uh, encounters or sources, such as settlement works with tools required to deal with some of these legal issues. That's uh, specifically for the most at risk. This could also po uh, possibly be strengthened if provision of legal advice was expanded to other professions. I know this is quite, um, given Susan's comments about how tightly regulated uh, the legal profession is Canada, um, there are jurisdictions in which um, uh, the provision of legal advice has been ex uh, in, uh, expanded or enlarged. So with that, I wanted to just take a few moments to acknowledge uh, the Department of Justice uh, under the leadership of uh, Susan McDonald and her, uh, and her research for moving forward with both the CLPS and these studies, uh, these qualitative studies, um, Wage and Gender Equality Canada, which, um, sorry, wage, wage is the, an acronym. It's uh, Women and Gender Equality Canada uh, for their financial contribution, as well as IRCC for their financial contribution to these studies. And of course, the authors of these reports, Victoria uh, Esses, Alina Sutter, and Florentine Verhage. Um, so with that, thank you very much for attending this session. Um, just to note, uh, when we at our peak, we're at, we were at 110 participants. We're at 94. So for those who stayed to the very end, chapeau. Um, and uh, we encourage you to check out some of the other future P2P virtual workshop series um, and hope you benefit uh, from them as much as uh, I do and as much as the panel here does. Thank you very much and have a great and safe and healthy uh, 2022.